Thanks. Thanks to all of you for being here. I'm just so anxious to hear the story of um, how coaching came to be at Todd Elementary and where you started and the progress that you made in the course of the year. So um, let's, let's start with just an overview of what student achievement was looking like at Todd when the two of you came to that school. Well, we started, Cindy and I both were new to Todd. In the summer of 2011, we, we got together a couple times and said, uh, we have a lot of work cut out for us. The restructuring occurred that summer. We, people got shifted around all over. We brought new teachers into Todd. We had teachers that were there that had been there for a long time. Um, but we were both new to that building, so we were like the outsiders coming in, uh, trying to lead them in a different direction. Uh, we looked at the data. In September, we have building PLCs once a month, and it's usually like the second week of the month. So we met, and we looked at our data that was coming in, and it was sort of a concern because we looked at the BAS reading levels that they came from, so kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade. We looked at their spring scores, and we created uh, a data board, and we laid it all out, and we realized that our biggest crisis was in first grade. <coughs> that we had 64% of our kids that were entering first grade that were below grade level according to the BAS reading levels. And so the red flags started going up. And the teacher's first response was, oh my goodness, we need to hire more interventionists. We've got to do more interventions. We can't do this. We can't get them out of the hole. Um, and so I said, let's step back and take a look. And I called um, over, Lene was new to this district as well, and I called Lene Tordell, who she's the assistant superintendent of curriculum. And we sa I said, can you come over and let's have some dialogue about this? I said, because we really have to come up with a concrete plan to decide how we're going to move forward because the teachers are all like, we can't do this. And so Cindy, who's my building reading specialist, Marsha, who's the district reading specialist, and Lene and myself sat down as a team and through a lot of dialogue and through a lot of questioning because we were concerned too about just abandoning the whole interventions for a while and looking at the universal but we talked about that this is a universal instruction problem and with somehow we have to tackle that process and so we decided that we would try to build the capacity of our teachers to work with those students and make sure that they're re receiving high quality universal instruction with fidelity and so Cindy and I looked at each other and we're like, well, what are we going to do about these tier two and tier three kids? And it was, there was a lot of angst about it because we kept thinking, if we wait two or three months and we don't do anything with these kids, are they really going to move forward like they need to? But we took a leap of faith <laughs> and we said, okay, we're going to do this. So we sat down with the teachers and we met with them and I said, you know, we're going to set these high expectations. We're going to make sure that you have the instruction that you need in the staff development to provide a high quality and in universal instruction and to implement it with fidelity at that point because we had people all over the board and we were bringing two buildings <coughs> together so people had different ways of doing things and one of our concerns was that we didn't feel like the staff really knew the, the high expectations they didn't really seem to know what they should be exiting at, at that point um, like, as I said, we had different people in different places at that point, and so we had to take that and work with that and see how we could move forward at that point. So and we had to make sure that they knew that those were non-negotiables, that we expected them to be able to do the components of balanced literacy, and that we would be there to support them, but we needed to move forward from that process. So, and believe me, it was not pretty in the beginning. So, but. Uh, Marsha and Cindy and Lene sat down and came up with a plan. So, mm -hmm. And when she speaks to the point that we were going to put these children on hold, our most struggling readers, that was really difficult for me because being um, under the RTI model, I should be working with those struggling children. So I had to do a whole paradigm shift. My mindset had to change that I can't work with just a few, I have to work with a whole. And so that was a huge shift in my thinking, not an easy one, but once I once I came to grips with that, I guess, or really understood it and could embrace it, then I could move forward um, with that goal. And we decided then that we would target our kindergarten teachers and our first grade teachers because kindergarten is where it all begins. We knew that we had a problem going into first grade already, and we could deal with that, but we really needed to get at the very base, the very core of the issue. And so that's where we started was with, with those children and saw some very, very good results. Because as a result of that coaching model, we 
and the high implementation mm -hmm. or the high expectations that Melody said these are non-negotiable and the district also. We at the end of that kindergarten year then had 88% of those students, those kindergartners, exit at or above grade level. So, which was a total flip of a triangle, if you think of it as a triangle where 64% of the students were below, now we were looking at only 12% below grade level. So it was a total change just with using that, um, the coaching model and getting in there and working with the <coughs> teachers. So that was really, really good to see. It was a 52% increase from the year before. So it sounds like you really... Um, you looked at a huge amount of data that showed mm -hmm. some a, a number of unacceptable trends and then really sized down and focused in to what you thought would be the area where you had mm -hmm. the greatest it would have the greatest impact mm -hmm. and really went to work kind of thinking big starting mm -hmm. small and we used not only the BAS levels but we also looked at our map data and then we looked at you know any formative assessments the teachers were using and you know, particularly with K through three building, there's a lot of observation that still goes on at that level to mm -hmm. determine what kids are able to do. So, and it was step by step walking them through the process with assistance from central office. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the specific steps that you used to build teachers' capacity mm -hmm. and to ensure the implementation <coughs> of your district absolutes or non-negotiables mm -hmm. with fidelity? Mm -hmm. We did. When we decided that we had to go into kindergarten and first grade, we thought, oh gosh, that's a huge task. <laughs> so Marsha came in and we worked together to build a, to develop a schedule so that we could make sure that we got into every mm -hmm. kindergarten and first grade classroom mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So, and we used a gradual release of responsibility model. And what we, what we have to also talk about is the foundational year that occurred before this. Um, we, as a team of 21 reading specialists, specifically are not, we have 21 reading specialists in Beloit, but our elementary reading specialists, we needed to gather. So the year before, we took every component of balanced literacy and we did a read and reflect. So we did some current research. Mm -hmm. What is the, and then we, we discovered, oh, it's not read aloud, it's interactive read aloud. Well, how is that different than read aloud? So as a team of reading specialists, we had to tighten our non-negotiables on what does it look like, feel like, sound like in this current trend of best practice. So for um, interactive read aloud, shared, guided, and independent, we, for every component, it took about a good month and a half, almost two months per component um, when we would meet, because we also have our own PLC group that meets on Friday afternoons. We did a read and research on a chapter we were studying. Very often it was when readers struggle or comprehending and fluency or the continuum, kind of using all those resources. So read and research, reflect, then um, create, mm -hmm. because then we had to create this PD. So we all agree now what are our non-negotiables that are our understandings and philosophy that we all are going to on. Now we're going to create these. Um, we went through and then for each component, created an absolute for interactive read aloud, an absolute. So we have a balanced literacy statement that encompasses it all. But then each component, interactive, read aloud, shared, guided, and independent, has its own appendix that describes what it should look like in Beloit and then what it should look like then. It's kind of a down and dirty look at the interactive, read alouds for SDB teachers will. This is what we expect. So that tightens it up. And then, um, then we created a PD and then we delivered it. Um, and that's kind of where what leads us to the delivery piece is this year. Um, so Cindy and I sat down and we said, okay, how are we going to um, universally how do we coach get into all, of them? all these classrooms? Starting with kindergarten and first grade and understanding that gradual release of responsibility is best practice for adults as well, not just children. Um, so then what we did is we looked and we said, okay, we're going to on Monday make that a, now think of one teacher at a time. We're going to give that teacher a 3D model of what this interactive read aloud on one week, interactive read aloud. Um, should look like on Monday. We're going to model it. That reading expert's going to go in and model what it should look like. Tuesday, up to them. May need a second 3D model? Maybe not. On Wednesday, then that would be the shared experience, which you'll see in the video of the two teachers are sitting up in front together, very close by. The coach is there if they need them. Then Thursday would be guided. The coach steps back a little further, coaches from a distance, or whispers, those whisper moments in on how the, to ensure the fidelity. And then on Friday would be the independent. 
but before each of these moments occurs and so what happens is Cindy and I I took first and Cindy you took, took, first grade. I took kindergarten, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I'd come in um, fly into the first classroom do my 20 minute lesson fly into the next classroom um, stuck around for the intervention time at that point we were piloting and then 20 minutes in this lesson 20 minutes in this lesson but before all of this happened we knew if the reading specialist we needed that research reflect process we needed to offer that front load for the teachers too so before the week of model shared guided um, model shared guided independent occurs we offer a front load so we front load with an article DVD clips um, and have discussion about this is what you're going to see and why does the research support this right now it's kind of the same parallel we did last mm -hmm. year for the reading specialist so, so this is really the the training or the presentation the initial content that's mm -hmm. presented to teachers they each get um, the absolutes because mm -hmm. they have the balance literacy overview statement we've done that um, but that's the moment that they get um, and this is the coaching binder that each reading specialist has so each teacher has the absolute sheet they also have the chapters they're supposed to read ready and done and then that part of that time is the reflection and dialogue about the, the current best practice and study and some DVD clips if necessary mm -hmm. if they feel mm -hmm. like they need that um, but then each each reading specialist we've we've sent them in so it's tight across the district We've sent each reading specialist in with the very same, these are the resources to use. This is, this is the delivery process to make sure everyone across the district gets the same resources for front loading. And we've uploaded those to our reading room too so they can have access to those because we want everybody at the same time. So essentially at the same time this year now, that was the pilot year, um, then, okay, so I'll go back to this. Then on Friday, after the five-day model, Okay, each teacher in this grade level got one, one or two models, one shared, one guided, one independent. Then we gather back together and have that during their PLC time um, and have that reflection time. And then that's when we have a set of guiding reflection questions that we can offer the reading specialists to say, these are some guiding questions. Clearly they can go on and have their own in-depth conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but to guide them into some coaching questions that information should then offer the coach what additional coaching need is needed. You can do this in a small group with that grade level you started with in the front load, or as you, we demonstrated today, the one-on-one -on -one coaching. That will then illuminate maybe the next action step or the needs for that grade level. Um, and what does the grade level want? Or what is the grade level still fuzzy about? Um, so that always brings it back to though, our non-negotiables you know those conversations and it's it's sounding like um, this coaching model is systematic in that it's it's the the it's done the same way in all grade levels and in all schools and then it's also systemic in that everybody does it mm-hmm so you have all of those pieces so those we pieces. had almost 400 elementary teachers essentially getting the same coaching the first 10 12 ish weeks of school mm -hmm. because we believe that you know and some people say well you you didn't lay hands on your intervention children well those children who probably will may need intervention still were receiving good instruction mm -hmm. so we didn't abandon them because we were in there still opportunities for differentiating within those 12 you know those 10 12 weeks the classroom teacher can still do what she needs to do i think it also though gave the teachers additional time to get to know their children you know, instead of the old model of I'm going to just send them off to Cindy to take care of, this way of staying in the classroom, they really got a good view of those children before before sending them off. And then what we realize is some of them really don't need to go off and need intervention because just in building that capacity in the teachers and increasing the good universal instruction, they can get what they need right in the classroom, which is really the best place mm -hmm. for them to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we so. jump in too soon. Mm -hmm. We assume mm -hmm. they need it. Right. And after so many good weeks of universal instruction at the beginning of the year, um, you know, the research is actually showing now six to eight weeks of good universal instruction after the summer brain drain, mm -hmm. way they call it. And um, the one piece of research I heard recently is even then children of poverty may even need eight to ten weeks, mm -hmm. which we found that out after we chose the ten week model, which I think was very interesting to support because um, in this moment that I just happened to stay 
last year during the pilot. And do you remember I had 11 friends? You did. And they thought those 11 friends were all going to be LLI candidates. And I, after five days with them, I went, oh, no, three. Three I could see as potential LLI mm -hmm. candidates that didn't really understand how to orchestrate everything systematically together in their reading strategies. The other friends just needed more mm -hmm. universal instruction. Maybe some tier two, um, but nef definitely not. So then we've eliminated misidentifying mm -hmm. those tier three friends. Mm -hmm. So you, then we can you, really get to the real tier three friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. you've, you've really, um, yeah, I guess you said you said it well. You've you you are not over identifying kids for interventions. You're really backing up to making sure they are all receiving high quality universal instruction okay. first. Mm -hmm. So you're at the end, pretty much at the end of the 10 weeks now. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what the coach's role will be now after you've done all of this front end loading with your staff. You've got a, a good base um, in terms of building capacity for instruction using your absolutes with fidelity. What are the, what's the coach's role going to be now? I will need to still stay involved. I'll still need to get into the classroom to see what's going on, to still offer my resources, my help, my assistance, anything they need from me. Just maintain the relationship that we've built um, to know that I'm there and they can come to me. If they still need additional modeling, I can come in and do that. If they, and just their questions in general. I mean, I think the staff has opened up mm -hmm. and they're asking more questions now than they did initially last year because it was so new last year. Um, so still to be a part of all of this, I will be able to work with my tier three children that really need the help. That'll be my role now after the 10 or 12 weeks and to we're, get into that, mm -hmm. but still be there as a coach. It doesn't end just because I'm not in their classroom. So, And we'll do more PD mm -hmm. within the building now at our, at our um, staff meetings because we'll have the time now once things settle down to really go back and talk again a little bit about what does shared reading look like in your classroom and share that amongst the entire staff and what do these components actually look like right. in your classrooms because you can't pretend it's gone because I'm not in there anymore. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it's that constant talk. reflection mm -hmm. piece that they have to go back yeah, to. Yeah, right? that's what I was going to say, that reflection, those reflection right. notes she can refer to and who, you know, and we're in the process too. Um, Tomorrow, actually, I'm writing then a ten, our 10-week reflection survey that every teacher who's participated in this is going to take a 10-week um, survey monkey. And um, we're going to go through and get feedback because we need it feedback. We need to know what, what could we do tighter for next year. Um, because there's, you know, and, and, and talking to Lene, there will be a next year because there's always something that we need to develop capacity in. Mm -hmm. um, because if you think you're ripe, you'll rot. But if you think you're green, you'll grow, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to keep understanding that new practices come along, new research about the brain comes along. We have to keep building that capacity every year. We don't ever, we don't ever stop. Um, so some of that follow-up coaching could come from her reflection conversations um, in, or a rubric that could follow each to say, where are you at? We, do, we have used a rubric in the past with teachers to circle where they're at and I'm trying to think what we use that for. Um, to identify where they still want further coaching. But that can be left up to the individual mm -hmm. reading specials to determine the needs of the teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering um, how you would describe the, the level of coachability of, of teachers in your school right now. What's, what's been important? How, how have you built awareness of and openness to coaching and where do you think you are now in terms of where you were when you started at Todd? Well, I think that, you know, we've had a lot of open dialogue about the fact that we were doing this. We've encouraged them to be open to people coming mm -hmm. into their classrooms. But I will, and I said this earlier, we still have people here and here on the trail, if you want to look at it that way. We have some people that are much more receptive to someone coming in and sitting with them and modeling for them and really learning from that experience. And then we have some people that haven't accepted the fact that they probably need to change some of their strategies. So we're, we're kind of all over the board, but our staff meetings are set up so that we have time to dialogue about that along the way. And we tried to make it non-threatening to them because we wanted them to realize that it was something we were doing with everyone. It wasn't like we were going through and we're picking on you because we know that you right. have a problem. This is a universal 
coaching model that everyone's going to get. Some people are at different places in their careers and some people might glean more information than others, but you need to work with your reading specialist to gain the knowledge that you need. And I think it, and as Cindy said earlier, it is a paradigm shift for them because it's a whole new way of doing things. And uh, and I think that we do have people that are still resistant. Mm -hmm. So we have some people that really have taken the information and ran with it and they're excited about it and we've seen and I think that's why we've seen some growth in our data because those people that really were eager to learn have taken what Cindy and Marcia have worked with them on and they've shown in their classroom the data has shown that they've shown great improvement but we still have a few that we have mm -hmm. more work to do with so mm -hmm. and I think that's an ongoing process as mm -hmm. Marcia said you're never at a finite end because people come and go they're at different places in their career they're in different places with their training and we have people that are in my building that never were officially trained in balanced literacy. And last year we sent every single staff in my building to guided reading training just because we wanted to make sure that we weren't asking them to do something they didn't really understand how to do. So mm -hmm. I think you every year you have to go through that process with your staff and figure out where they are and then work with mm -hmm. them. Um, it's kind of like a needs assessment. It what is sort they of a needs assessment. And that's why when we did that balanced literacy assessment when we used the rubric probably five or six years ago, it was somewhat non-threatening because it you know they could go through and kind of mark where they thought they were on the rubric and then you could sit down and have a dialogue with them and say okay this is what it seems like you're asking for help what can I do to support you there and to me that makes coaching a little less threatening mm -hmm. because it, it's not evaluative at all mm -hmm. and that's the battle that we had to fight at the beginning that when I come in with Cindy or I come in with Marsha or I come in with Lene we're not there just to evaluate you we're there to see what's going on and then we're there to support you if you have questions and uh, so you know, that's the biggest thing when administrators and people start coming in your room, everybody mm -hmm. thinks they're being evaluated. Mm -hmm. So you have to get beyond that. Talk to, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about the role of the principal in this whole process. Well, I think that Cindy and I work side by side, and then last year it was Marsha and Lene as well. Um, but the flip side of that is they don't need to see Cindy as my person to come tell me when they're not doing what they're supposed right, to do. Right. So it's like they know that I'm the administrator and they know that we're colleagues and they know that we're, you know, I go to her for information as well. I'm not a reading specialist, so I have questions sometimes too. And I might go in and watch someone do something and I might go to her and say, okay, this is what I saw. Is this what I'm really seeing or do I not understand this? But again, it's that whole piece that it's not, I'm not evaluating them. It's like this is a growing process for everyone. So, um, but when we do professional learning communities once a month, you know, we're in there together, we're working together with them. When we uh, do staff meetings, many times we both have a dual role. I have another reading specialist that's there part-time, so we pull her in as much as possible. So, um, but it's, it's that trust factor I think you have to build with them. And again, some people are here and some people are there mm -hmm. with that process. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do it if she weren't in my corner because you have to have total administrative support to implement a coaching model. If you don't have that, I can't see that it would work. Um, and we couldn't so, go district-wide right. until we had a central office right. decision to mm -hmm. go 10 weeks, mm -hmm. right. 10 and weeks universal. Thing, and one thing we did do, though, with that 10 weeks universal is the principals have been asked to join us in some mm -hmm. of our coaching mm -hmm. sessions so they get a clear idea of what all those components should look like. Mm -hmm. So when Mrs. Wergo does go in to do her observations, she knows what she's looking mm -hmm. for and doesn't have to come and ask me mm -hmm. because and we do mm -hmm. walk a very fine line with our staff. We are peers, but it's a really fine mm -hmm. line and, and so that can make that can be a challenge at times. But And all the principals, we just ask the principals mm -hmm. to join one 20-minute session a day. So join the model, the second model. So align yourself with one classroom mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just go join that so it's five days of 20 minutes mm -hmm. for interactive, five days of 20 minutes for shared, five days of 20 minutes for guided and independent. But then the beautiful part you're going to hear in a little bit is Steve's shifting then the principals um, are going to be doing some, it's another way to coach the principals mm -hmm. as well because then this summer the principals went through a process they're learning and Steve's going to talk to that about in a little bit um, about Cindy, Cindy and Melody or Melody and another a exemplar teacher mm -hmm. could go into a classroom and that question that she had then in that moment she can lean to the reading specialist or the other the other teacher and say okay so tell me about that strategy she used in that moment mm -hmm. so it's a way for it's not um, in that moment actually Steve says it's not evaluative it's a moment to coach up the principal to say mm -hmm. so this is what it looks like and so why'd she do that mm -hmm. you know and it's a way for the reading specialist to say 
look at this amazing moment. Let me tell you what's happening and why is this happening. So the reading specialist is still aligning with the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. It's it's to, and when the classroom teacher, then they sit and reflect, and when the classroom teacher can't, maybe it can't, she goes, I'm not sure what you're talking about, then the reading specialist will say, well, in this moment, this is what you did. And so help the, help the principal understand, why was that the decision you made at that moment? So it's really to build up the teacher. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the bigger view of your coaching model then also includes not only building the capacity of teachers, mm -hmm. but building the capacity of principals mm -hmm. as instructional leaders mm -hmm. yes. around those absolute high-quality mm -hmm. instructional practices, yeah. balanced assessment practices, mm -hmm. and collaborative practices that mm -hmm. we know will, will serve to improve student learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've tried to say to my staff, I'm learning along with them sometimes. I mean, we all have our strengths. Absolutely. And so, it, it, just in in summary, we we often have um, have schools or districts um, ask us, well, how do we go about building a coaching model for systems change? If there were one piece of advice that you would give to schools or districts, principals or coaches who are just starting to build a model. You've been working on yours really mm -hmm. for several years here. What would that one piece of advice be? I think you would be willing to take the risk to do it. I mm -hmm. think that was the biggest struggle for us. And we oh. talked about our belief system. We talked about the fact that we believe that all children can be successful. It doesn't even matter their socioeconomic status. That we can make them be successful readers. So I think you have to build that belief in your teachers and then be willing to take a risk. Mm -hmm. Because, and we said earlier, you know, it was a leap of faith to say, okay, we're not going to do any it interventions was. for almost three months in our building. It we didn't was. do any interventions. And that was a totally different model at Todd. Everything had been pulled out at Todd before. Every kid was sent to different people to get fixed, so to speak. And so to pull them back and rein them back in and say, let's see if we can build your capacity so that we don't have to send all these kids all over the building to get fixed. And then they, they're gone for 30 minutes and they've got a magical fix and they're going to come back. Um, but it was a struggle to get them to buy into that, and we're still struggling with that because we still have people throwing up the flags now. We're wasting time. We're wasting time. No, we're not wasting time. We're building your capacity so that we don't have to have some because we will never have enough interventionists to meet all their needs if we put them all in intervention. So, um, so I think if you're sitting down at the at the table and saying where do we go from here, it's like you have to talk about what your belief system is in that building and in the district and then you have to decide okay what are we willing to give up so that we can do this and really move forward with it and and then look at the data and say did it make a difference and I think you know when we sort of held our breath until spring we did we really yeah. said okay you know are we really going to see the results because I can remember Marcia coming running calling me up said have you looked at your spring map dad I'm like <laughs> not yet not yet she said you'll be so excited <laughs> well, see, until spring, though, we, you know, we kept seeing the bass levels go up, we saw. But you still, when you do something like the map, you want to make sure that it's carrying over. And it's like, so it was nice to see that we reaped those rewards, particularly in that kindergarten and first grade, because that's where we put all of our work. Mm -hmm. So that gave us a little bit of an impetus this year when we came back and said, okay, we saw this much growth from the coaching model, and now we're going to focus on all grade levels, and we'll just keep moving forward. But... Uh, you know, you still kind of have that little knot in your stomach. Are we really doing what we need to do for all the kids that are in this mm -hmm. building? Because they're all across the board, their needs. Mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're a transient enough district that you know some of those kids last year in kindergarten didn't receive that high quality instruction that are now in first grade. So now we're having to backtrack and go back and say, okay, these kids are missing a few pieces. How can we try to catch them up? Uh, so you're always, it's always a game to try to figure out how you can meet all their needs. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that was the importance of doing it across the district because your goal is then eventually that if I get a student from Merrill or Robinson or Gaston that they would have gotten the same high quality instruction mm -hmm. in their kindergarten or first grade that we were trying to do at Todd. I mean that's the whole goal in this district because we know we have kids that bounce around a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And with that we had to make sure that the teachers will now own their data. They really, the data is the core. So you have to look at that data and see where your students are and where do you want them mm -hmm. to go. And that, that's a piece that you can never forget and you just have to, that's another change of mindset is to have to get the, the teachers to own that data. Mm -hmm. so. And one other highlight that's happened with all this is that I think it has forced them to collaborate more with each other. Mm -hmm. Because we had a lot of teachers that were kind of working on their own little islands and then we had teachers come over and 
and, and we can say this across the district, it wasn't pretty. We had the Todd teachers on this side, the Morgan teachers on this side, which is the two that came together in my building. So with this coaching model and giving them the time to meet together and reflect together, it's forced them to collaborate with each other, which was a good thing because we had to get them to work together. But really in September and October, it was like the battle lines on either side and who's going to win. And it was that way across the district because two buildings came together. and. So everyone came with their own ideas about what was right and what was wrong. So. On the other hand, you were presented with a wonderful opportunity it was a, to to, mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. a culture, mm -hmm. yeah. to reculture mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. district, and that's really what you yeah. Did. And that's and that that's been the that's been the fun side of it. And I said, if you really, it would to make the perfect storm. We would have just moved everybody all over the district because the hard part was that when you the people that were at Todd and then new people coming in. So it was like, this is my territory and you're coming over. If we would have just shifted everybody around then. But it has been, it's, there's been a lot of fun things about it. You know, mm -hmm. there's been some angst about it, but there's been I'm some sure. fun about it as yeah. well. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing yeah. your story today. Um, I know you've, you've been at this process of building a multi-level system of support within your district for a long time and this is a great example of you continue to grow and develop mm -hmm. and refine your practice so thank you all so much mm -hmm. for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Well thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.